Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Well, no society can be great unless there are watchdogs, people who are watching everything that takes place and telling us what's going on. And that's exactly what journalists do. I think here in Hawaii there are few journalists as well known as Chad Blair, who works at the Civil Beat. He's been involved watching the scene here in the state for many, many years. And I consider it a real privilege to chat with him today. You're going to get to know a little bit more about him, about his craft, about the state of journalism, and about what's going on here in Hawaii. So please welcome to the program with me today, Chad. Chad Blair, aloha. Good to see you. Thank you, Dr. Akina. Oh, you just call me Kaylee. I will. In fact, you usually are interviewing me. That's true. And I've never called you Dr. Akina. It always I makes think. me very nervous because you ask the tough, tough questions. I'm a pussycat. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm delighted Thank to you. have you on the program today, and you're a journalist, but you started out in academia. In fact, you spent a stint teaching uh, right. American studies. That, that's what your PhD is in, is that right? It is. Here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, I actually did not go to J school, to journalism school. I'm, is that right? I'm totally happy to admit that. Uh, but American studies is interdisciplinary, and that means you study a lot of different fields. Now, that's the same degree that Governor Abercrombie that's earned correct. as well. In Did fact, you? I've even looked over his dissertation, and if I remember correctly, it has to do with Lewis Mumford and, and planning and so forth. And he was quite a guy. Uh, Neil, there's got a lot of background that a lot of people don't know about him, but it is, in fact, the same PhD. I should say I've also taught political science, English, English as a second language, uh, a number of other classes But as today, well. instead of trying to pollute the minds of a few students, <laughs> you've gone mass media. I've got the power, <laughs> exactly. So w why are you in journalism? Well, academia was not um, enough to pay the bills. Okay, that's truthful. Yeah, I have taught at a number of schools. I would say I've done the circuit, actually. So you're making the really big bucks at Civil Beat. <laughs> <laughs> enough to pay the bills, and for which I'm very grateful. But being an adjunct professor, including for a long time at Hawaii mm -hmm. Pacific University, where I know you've taught, it can be difficult, let alone lacking sure. health insurance and things like that. But eventually, over the years, uh, journalism turned out to be the more solid paycheck, and thus my career choice. How many people in Hawaii really make a living off of journalism? What, what percentage of journalists actually make hmm. a decent livelihood? You know, I know so many of them, uh -huh. and I'd probably have to include the TV and radio and the Star sure. Advertiser and the, and the other newspapers. I'm sure it's in the hundreds. Uh, I don't know that it goes over a thousand. I'd want to be careful there. Probably better to check with unions on those numbers. But it's a small and, frankly, a shrinking industry as it is nationally and internationally. And that's why I'm all the more grateful to have a job in journalism these days. It's shrinking all over the world. It it's shrinking in the country. In a sense, becoming more centralized as well. Isn't that happening? Centralized, or maybe another word for that is... Well, I think, in fact, there's a broader range of information mm -hmm. that's out there. While you have had the consolidation and you have the same corporate entities, three or four of them now, the Time Warners and so forth, owning pretty much everybody else, you are seeing a lot of independent voices. Other voices aren't as controlled by upper media. Now, there are exceptions. Think about the Wall Street Journal. Sure. It, it controls, it's controlled by Murdoch. Murdoch also controls Fox. And, and there are problems with that. But with that has been a proliferation of other voices. In our case, an independent voice here in Civil Beat. We've actually expanded recently uh, our staffing and our intent to stay a player here in the local market. Well, let's talk a little bit about Civil Beat. I'm, I'm sure one of the most common questions you get is about your publisher founder, Pierre Omidyar, and what his relationship is to the actual product that is put out there. You know, he's a great guy. He, mm. um, it's no joke. You can read it in Forbes. He's a wealthy man. Well, I read he's a great guy in Civil Beat. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Several so, times. We only print the truth, <laughs> Kelly. You know, it's all about facts. And does, that, does the fact that you get your paycheck from oh. this gentleman influence the kind of reporting that you or your colleagues do? Uh, no, it See, does I not. Can do, I no, can it's all right. It's, a, it's an entirely <laughs> appropriate question to ask, and there are people that think that Pierre has an agenda and he wants that reflected in the Honolulu Civil Beat. I can tell you that he places great trust in his editors and reporters to do their own reporting. We have, in fact, written one or two things that were, I would say, critical of Mr. Omidyar. But Pierre is also a good man. He was there for the very first two years, the founding of Civil Beat, from 2010 to 2012. He was there every day, more than eight hours a day. He and Randy Ching, another founder, and they were absolutely committed. Never once can I think of where Pierre came up to me and said, that story that you wrote, 
you know, I, I disagreed with it. He caught me wrong on a fact check or two, How and I appreciated that? that. So did he tweet you something? No, he didn't. <laughs> he, just, he, he emailed me back when he was still using email. Well, so there is no conflict of interest. You just have to explain that there's just an appearance of a conflict of interest. I think it's fair for others to make uh -huh. that observation. I've heard it before. You hear the same thing about the, the New York Times, about Fox News. In some cases, it's more true than others. But I think uh, Pierre is a principled man and believes strongly in the fourth estate and independent voices. We need him more than ever. Well, that leads us to the issue of credibility. How credible do you think the industry of journalism in Hawaii is? Everything is so overshadowed what by what happened last year in this country with the presidential election and the rise of, and I'm going to use the quote marks as the president sure. does, fake news. The idea that we no longer are sure what is true and what is not true, what is being manipulated, distorted, is very disconcerting. You know, we're old enough to remember back when we had a morning and an evening newspaper. There was just three television stations and PBS, uh, maybe one or two radio stations, nothing like what we have today with the Internet. But we all shared the same news. We all read the same papers, the same sources. With the rise of talk radio, with the rise of the Internet, what's happening more and more is we're in an echo chamber and we tend, liberals and Republicans, conservatives and Democrats alike, to flock to the people that are saying things that sound right to us rather than is accurately presented and balanced and informed. And this is the biggest concern I have in journalism along with the fact that it's also not becoming financially profitable. There, there are audiences that are out there that will gravitate toward a certain perspective, a certain worldview, markets, if you will, Correct. and they get fed by a constant stream of information on social media, radio, print media, and so forth. How can you wade through all of this and, and tell what's objective? I don't think you can. I do think that illustrates why it's so important to rely on what I call mainstream media, what Sarah Palin calls the lamestream media, but these are staffed by reputable, experienced individuals. And mind you, many of them are in it for the profit. They're trying to make money. That's what the New York Times and the Washington Post are trying to do. That's what Fox News is trying to do. But even with Fox News, Fox News, you have some pretty good reporters, not the Bill O'Reilly's, not the Sean, Hann Sean Hannity's, but certainly Brett Baer, I think, is, is a good reporter, Megyn Kelly until she left, uh, Chris Wallace. I think that to start doubting those people and questioning that presenting a story to you that they've worked on and they've put their reputation on the line for simply because you don't agree with the ideology that may be coming across is a very dangerous precedent. Well, let's talk about local news. Sure. Let's talk about mainstream. Because you'd have to have me back for a whole other hour to talk about nationally, so yes, Absolutely. let's go local. But when, when you're talking about mainstream providing some kind of anchor for credibility, does that really apply here in, in the local scene? I mean, do we have those icons, uh, the, those writers who are respected because everyone has seen a career of credible reporting and so forth through the, in our mainstream media? Or is our mainstream media subject to the commercialism that we see in much of the mainland? Uh, yes, to your second question, and there has been a change in answer to your first question. For one thing, you no longer have two newspapers, although they did have a joint operating agreement for many years. They were competitors, and this state, this city, were better for it. And you had a lot of good reporters and editors and columnists who had a lot of experience, and I think all of us were better for that. Well, back in the day when they were competitors, Correct. when there were two robust news newspapers, we were suspicious back then of their conflicts of interest because they had the same advertisers. Rightly so. And now, th without the competition, we should perhaps be a little more suspicious. I'm concerned, and I know a lot of those people at the Star mm -hmm. Advertiser, they're my friends. I know a lot of people who lost their jobs when the merger happened. It was in 2010, the same year that Civil Beat was founded. But I think that's been a concern. Let's talk about TV. There well, are let's just back up a second, back then we'll get to right. TV. You talk about the Star Advertiser. Many of us are not aware in the public as to how pervasive the Star Advertiser is in terms of its ownership of print media. It's immense. It's got Midweek, for example, right. has a terrific printing press out west. It owns at least three of the four neighbor island papers, that's, if I have that That's track. right. I think there's only one it doesn't own. And I can't remember if it's the Maui paper or the Kauai paper. Mm -hmm. Forgive me for not knowing that. And there's some other smaller publications as well. It is a monopoly. And in case you have forgotten, it's also not owned by someone who lives here. Unlike Pierre Omidyar, who does live here with his family, David Black is from Canada. So yeah. that's a concern. What were you going to say about television? Well, 
what happened there is you have uh, KGMB, Hawaii uh, News right. Now, and uh, two other stations that are essentially the same station in terms of its news content. You have KITV, which recently was bought out uh, by yet another corporate owner. By the way, I should acknowledge that they are our media partner. And then you have KHON. What you're seeing more and more on the TV market, the news market, is less time at the legislature and much more time covering, well, frankly, sports, uh, the weather, in traffic, because that is where the the markets say the research says we are. That's interested. right, and you can translate it to your app. <laughs> I think you can exactly as well. So there's a, a consumerism uh, here that, to Correct. a high degree, as opposed to necessarily reporting the facts and just the facts. Right. I think what you have to do is find a balance because mm -hmm. consumerism does drive so much of everything. Well, it, it's hard to sell news. It is, and, and so. These organizations, Hawaii News Now in particular, need, need to find ways that are creative and so forth. How does that affect the role that journalism is supposed to play in society? Well, even at Civil Beat, we're very cautious, or rather very aware, I should say, of how many eyeballs are going to the page. With analytics in this day and age, we know exactly how many clicks we're getting. We know exactly how long people are staying on that article. It's not a mystery. It's a way to measure whether those stories are of appeal. But we feel it's important to have issues that may not seem as sexy. Problems with police corruption, for example, an area that we, I think, have excelled on. Troubles with our nursing and care homes in Hawaii. I can name any number of those. And then maybe a little something on the lighter side. One of the best traffic stories that we ever had on our site was about why people in Hawaii back their cars into parking places Fascinating, of rather course. than and putting them very front. local. Yeah, it was. And it was enormously popular. But having said that, recently a story that became our number one, uh, at least in recent demographics, was about a care home facility in which a young child was almost lost, apparently because of, of neglect on the part of the owner of the facility, who, by the way, is connected to the police department. What's the advantage of print media over televised media? Is there the ability to deal with a story in the kind of depth that it really requires to have understanding? I think it's twofold. On the one hand, TV news, it's just like that. Mm -hmm. You can't have it very long. You've got to have images, you have the B-roll. And I think most people watch the TV report and that's it. I don't think too many people go back and look in the archive, even if they are archiving those stories, to, to remember what exactly was said. In a print article, or online in my case, it's there forever, hopefully, and with a Google search, with strong SEO search engine optimization, right. you can call those stories up again and again, and there they are. But the downside of that is how many people are going to spend the time to get through that entire article rather than just watching the TV news, or as we, you and I were talking about earlier, just reading the headline and moving on. There's, of course, a trade-off. When we come back from a break, I want to ask you about the broader political environment. Sure. How being in a virtually one-party state... In virtually? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I forgot there are four Republicans left. But five, I five. think. Five. <laughs> but that was yesterday. <laughs> and, and tell us how that affects the quality of journalism. Of we'll be right back after a short break. I'm with Chad Blair of Civil Beat, and you're watching a Hanakako every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Don't go away. You want to talk about some socially sensitive issues relevant to women? Listen to these guys. Well, I think it's important in Judaism that we don't take the Bible literally. We take it seriously. Okay. I agree, and the, really the key to understanding Christianity is compassion. If you're compassionate towards other people, you are living a Christian life. And that relates also to dealing with women and men and women issues as well. Mm. Are women and men equal? They're equal. Who's Why better? Be Who's better? <laughs> Depends tune on in, what. Tune in. My name is Mark Schlav, and I'm the host of Law Across the Sea. And Law Across the Sea is a program that brings attorneys who have traveled across the sea and live in Hawaii or are staying in Hawaii for a time to talk about their travels, where they're from, where they're going, and bring it all together because really we're all connected some way, although we travel across the sea. So I hope that you'll tune in and watch our program. Thank you very much. Welcome back from our break. We're here with Chad Blair, exclusive on Ehana Kako here on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. At Grassroot Institute, we love to partner with ThinkTech because ThinkTech is a 
an organization that is putting out original content about 35 hours every week from Honolulu. And it's all about culture, the arts, politics, virtually everything you can possibly talk about. And you can access that content at thinktechhawaii.com. We also like to say, Ehana Kako. You've heard me say that many times. It's kind of like a venerable old saying here in Hawaii, a pule kako. Let's pray kako together. At Grassroot, we love to say, Ehana Kako. Let's work together. Think of the terrible alternative. Let's work together for a better economy, government, and society. And here's somebody who's helping us to do that with good information, and that's Chad Blair. So, Chad, how does being in a one party state affect the quality of journalism? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it certainly reduces the diversity of voices that are out there. I mean, say what you will about Sam Sloan, who I think is a wonderful man and very principled about things like taxes and transparency. Um, but I miss his voice at the state Senate. Instead, it's 25 Democrats. Having said that, I should be clear, there are a wide range of diverse opinions within those 25 people. There are factions. There are some people in there that are more conservative, I would argue, than Sam Sloan was. Well, if you don't have very many uh, counterparty people right. standing up, making speeches, giving news releases, and, and taking a contrarian stand on a given issue, where do those views uh, get... Uh, D d uh, who distributes those views? Who, who points, points those them views out? are being lost. In Sloan's case, I would say in particular, is opposition to tax increases and fees, something that happens at every single legislature. And we're seeing it in this session. It's, we have to pay the bills. I understand that. But when so Sam Sloan is gone, you don't have that voice. On the House side, you do still have five Republicans. It was six as of two weeks ago when Beth Fukumoto right. announced that she was leaving the party. You can still count on someone like Gene Ward, a uh, longtime Republican, speaking out about tax increases. Bob McDermott as well. There are some conservative folks. But you've also got Republicans like Cynthia Thielen, who is a moderate, uh, in some ways, a, a borderline Democrat, a liberal in some of the views that she has about the environment, for example. But does it become harder and harder for journalism to actually portray a contrary point of view? Do, do, does journalism simply default because yeah. the story has to get written, yeah. uh, the program has to be put on by 5.30? Does it default to what's available there, which is the official story that's good? There's a couple of ways to answer your question. It's sort of a lazy form of journalism. Mm -hmm. You know, get argument A and then argument B so that you're being balanced. And well, that's, that's a little too easy. And I'll have to admit that I've relied that. I'm on deadline. I got to get that uh, that's right. That story it's filed. Like, it's like a, almost midnight, you call me up and say, Kaylee, I need a I need a, I need a quote. You. Gene, it's Chad. I need a quote. And, and, and by God, you guys are good one. I'm just kidding. You but do there's good some work. truth to that. Thank you. But it's, there, there is some truth to that. I think where some journalists are moving, and I think Civil Beat is trying to do this in many ways, is to get beyond the he said, she said, to actually trying to find out what the real answers are and to understand the implications. That's a harder form of journalism, something you simply can't turn around when you have day-to-day -day deadlines. But we do have a number of reporters who take longer to work on a story and to actually challenge the assumptions that are being made about those arguments. Now, you believe that Civil Beat gives an opportunity to challenge assumptions, to present a point of view that's not in the more mainstream media. How, how well is that job going right now? One of the most popular sections that we have is community voices. You yourself have, right. I believe, been featured in Many them. times. And uh, it's a light edit. We don't control the editorial content. We'll correct typos and things like that. But the range of voices that we've had, I'll just give you one example, the, the aid in dying issue, which appears to uh, have died at the legislature this session, uh, that uh, a mentally competent individual can take life-ending medication. Right. Um, we have presented probably more than just about any other topic the, the pros and cons on that issue. And if we were one-sided, if we were biased, you wouldn't have that. Having said that, our editorial board actually wrote a column, an editorial, saying that this should in fact be passed. So we have to acknowledge that as well. There's one other area that we have, and that's the community comment section that runs at the end of every single article. Now that's dicey business, because when we first started this, Pierre had this philosophy, you're not going to be anonymous. You can't just make some sort of remark and not have your name and face stamped to that. If you're going to say it, you better own it. Since then, we've modified our policy, and we also have a, an algorithm system trying to filter out, if you will, the uh, uncivil comments that sometimes come in. But I think it does make a, for a good presentation, fairly well-rounded of the issues. 
what issues are being underreported mm. here in Hawaii? What, what's one that, that really should be getting a lot more attention, but for whatever reason, mainstream media is simply not touching it? I'm going to have to plug us for having done something which was the right thing to do, and that's looking into corruption at Honolulu Police Department at HPD. And Nick Ruby and others, but particularly Nick, have looked at a number of things, the number of misconduct cases involving officers, the fact that those names are not made public except in rare cases, even though they are uh, county employees on the public tax dollar, the problems with Chief Louis K. Aloha, the former chief and the investigation. I remember one reporter from another paper coming up to me and saying, you know, we used to report that stuff. We used to cover it, but yeah. Well, we are continuing to report that because we think it's important. I'll add one other issue as well. Nathan Eagle is writing a lot about care homes and uh, the fact that we have over 1,700 facilities or nearly that much in the state, but we don't have a very good inspection system. Well, if you're going to put your elderly mother or your loved one, someone who's disabled, into a care home, don't you want to go online and be able to find out whether there's been neglect and abuse, whether they've been written up? We don't have that kind of transparency, even though the law is starting to nudge in that direction. They don't sound like sexy topics, but they, in fact, affect everybody. And those two examples where we have found some very interested readership. Well, one of the issues that has been covered the most by all media in the last several years has been the Honolulu Rail Project. Well, what has media, what have you learned in, in, in watching the coverage of this hmm. about the state of journalism? I actually have to credit Civil Beat, the Star Advertiser, and others for having done some terrific work on mm -hmm. the cost overruns, the delays, the mismanagement. I don't think, had there not been constant harping, particularly from those publications, some of the TV stations as well, that you wouldn't have, uh, let's put it this way, I don't think Kurt Caldwell would be having as difficult a time as he is right now trying to get the general excise tax surcharge extended into perpetuity were it not for that kind of reporting and holding Hart and the city accountable for the way they were managing that system. So you see media as having an impact upon policy. I do think that is exactly the case. And then there's other groups like... Uh, um, who I'm thinking of, Cliff Slater, right. Randy Roth, mm -hmm. Ben Cayetano, the former governor, very aggressive. From a very early time, they were pointing out that these are going to be problems, and guess what? They turned out to be correct. They do need the media to get that message out. Well, they can't simply start a web page and expect everybody to believe them, although they do have a web page. Well, they need the media, but maybe we need to qualify that a bit. They need media that will actually give them play, because there correct. has been mainstream media, and that doesn't. the fact that we have mainstream media down the center, Star Advertiser, right. the, the main television stations, doesn't mean that voices that are more on the outlier side will actually get heard, like Cliff Slater's Correct. and Randy Roth's. And then it's the job of the media to find out, to determine whether those are credible sources in the first place, and whether what they're saying actually holds water or not. So that's an example where I think we've done a good job, but I, I still wonder, we're looking at $10 billion right now. And I sometimes... This week. <laughs> yes, it could very well change. But when an article like in Civil Beat points out the fact that although we know the number of dollars, the uh, figures for the, the prime contractors, but we don't know for the subcontractors, and it was just an example of the kind of reporting that we've done, I think that's revelatory and really trying to track where our dollars are going. And that's speaking to a function that journalism should play. You know, we've, we both have liberal arts educations. We've learned about the fourth estate. We've learned about the importance in a democracy of having an independent free press in order to ensure the, the sustainability of that democracy. Uh, how well is journalism doing in that task here in Hawaii? <laughs> you know, something has happened since the election. Maybe it's not being f as felt as much locally as it is nationally, but I think it is. In response to the tumultuous uh, 2016, there's actually been an increase in a number of areas of people supporting. I, you know, I didn't see your red Make America Great cap when you <laughs> walked in here. Well, mine's written in Russian, so it would have been of any use anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, just as there has been more money pouring into some people's uh, campaign coffers, you've seen uh, an increase in the subscriptions of the New York Times. Here at home, Civil Beat, we're expanding staff and doing better than ever. And that's encouraging to think that people are starting to recognize you do need to have that independent fourth estate in order to hold the other three branches accountable. You see the growth in uh, journalism uh, directly related to the last election campaign? Well, certainly there are some numbers nationally, and you can point to other publications as well. I know that we're growing here in Hawaii, that we are actually adding staff. 
Uh, of course, we should acknowledge that the Star Advertiser recently has had to lay some people off because of the shrinking ad picture that they're having. I won't, I won't soft pedal that. That's a difficult challenge going forward. There's no guarantee that an organization like Civil Beat will be around, but the nonprofit model that we are now following, ones that other mainland groups are doing as well, media organizations, suggest a path uh, that might be winnable to keep good journalism coming into, well, coming into your computer, I guess, if not your doorstep. Well, is the jury out yet on whether or not the internet will make a difference? <laughs> I know I date myself with that very question. There's no question that the internet has made all the difference in the world, uh, and we are a different world because of it. Sometimes for the better, uh, a lot of times for the worse. This is a moving target. We don't know where this is going to shake out. Nobody has really quite figured out how to keep journalism really sustainable. But a lot of good people are trying to do that, and there's the need, the recognition that we simply must have it or we're not going to be a proper democracy. What should an individual do if he or she wants to grow up and become a Chad Blair, <laughs> to grow, grow up and get into professional journalism? You know, I don't know that I would advise uh, trying to go into journalism right now as a field because it's so challenging, but you see the young kids that are coming up today. You mm -hmm. see them um, at, uh, at school, in the classrooms. We've had a number of interns that have uh, done very well for us at Civil Beat. I've actually been encouraged, kind of excited to see that there's this hunger that I felt when I was growing up and as a paper boy, read Woodward and Bernstein and right. still remember the August 9th, 1974 headline of my local newspaper, Nixon quits, and how much of an impact that made on me. And that's exciting to think that they want to get into this profession even while there's doubt about whether they're going to be able to get paid. Well, maybe the icon today is no longer Woodward and Bernstein. It's, a, it's Snowden. <laughs> <laughs> it could very well be. Great to have you on board, Chad. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks a lot. My guest today, Chad Blair of Civil Beat. Everybody knows who he is, and <laughs> so I hope you've gotten to know who, him a little bit more today. Uh, journalism plays such a vital role in preserving democracy. We've got to do everything we can to call for the highest standards. I'm Kelly Akina with the Grassroot Institute. Until next week on Ehana Kako, we say aloha from Think Tech Hawaii. Bye-bye. That was good. Very well done. If this doesn't work out, consider it good.